Um, now I'd like to invite our first speaker, um, Pedro de Almeida, uh, who is a program manager at 4A Center for Contemporary Asian Art in Sydney, within an extremely dynamic neighborhood. Um, and I'm very pleased to have made it there and seen um, one of their exhibitions. Pedro is also an arts manager, curator, programmer, and writer. And over the past decade, he's developed and delivered artistic and cultural programs that have been distinguished by their engagement of culturally and socially diverse artists. Recent projects include at Foray uh, Dachi Dang and Omen Near and Far, this uh, made in 2017, which is a survey of one of the preeminent Vietnamese Australian artists who was also a founding member, artist member of 4A. A two part exhibition staged in Guangzhou and Sydney that presented new works by Lucas Elaine and Trevor Young. Um, informed by questions of temporality, exchange, and poetics of play in urban and natural environments. And there are several others, including Mass Group Incident in 2014, co-curated with Toby Chapman and Aaron Sito. I'm also very interested in Pedro's um, publishing and editorial practice, which spans um, his role having written for Art Asia Pacific, Art Monthly, Australian, uh, Australasia, Broadsheet Journal, Leap, among many others. He is the editor of 4A Papers, which is a newly established online platform for writing on contemporary art and culture in the Asia Pacific region. And he is currently um, pursuing an MPhil. Be interesting to hear, if at all, in questions, Pedro, if you'd like to talk a little bit about the politics of art projects in public housing sites, um, particularly having been in Sydney and having understood the kind of diversity of the neighborhoods there, um, this seems uh, 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 an important proposition to study. Thank you and welcome. Mahal, we haven't met. Um, hello, thank you for your assistance. So I've realized I kind of planned for an hour because I'm an egomaniac and now I realize I have 30 minutes. So I'll, I'll take the lead on drums. You provide the, the vibes on bass, and we're going to have to rock and roll, you know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to cut out the last half because it's, it's too much. So um, first of all, yeah, thank you. It's a real pleasure and privilege to be here. My name is Pedro de Almeida. I'm the program manager at the 4A Center for Contemporary Asian Art. Thank you to Pratik and Priyanka. Already, we've just met, but it's very clear your kind of commitment to um, not only to hospitality, but to education. It's really phenomenal, and really look forward to conversations over the coming days. Thanks also to the Australia Council for the Arts, um, which um, is a supporter of the ECH and is funding my, my appearance here. And also to um, Hema Rant Singh from the Australian High Commission for her support. And lastly, thank you to you, because um, one should never take for granted um, the existence, much less the commitment of an audience. So what am I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at this, this screen over here. Um, so should I just say next? All right, okay, so next. A little bit about 4A. Um, for many, for some of you who might not be familiar with us. So 4A, the 4A Centre for Contemporary Asian Art. We are an independent not-for-profit space in the heart of Sydney's Chinatown in Haymarket. We celebrated 20 years um, uh, last year, so we're 21 years old. We established in 1996. The 4A stands for Asian Australian Artists Association. We are, legally speaking, an, an incorporated, uh, incorporated association um, with not-for-profit status and charitable status. Um, we were founded by a group of um, not only Asian Australian artists, but other people who were committed to providing a space that really gave voice to the cultural contribution of um, Asian Australians to, um, to our country. The context in 1996, to think about this is, you know, this is a kind of pre-China boom era. This is an era when certainly there were um, many really significant um, Asian Australian artists and artists from Asia working in Australia who were severely underrepresented in, in state collections, in national collections, in visibility full stop. Um, importantly though, we never defined ourselves ethnically. You may have noticed I'm not Asian, for instance. It was always much more about having a dialogue um, within Australia that includes working with obviously Australian artists, taking Australians overseas, working with Aboriginal artists, and seeing things much more holistically. Um, this is our building, which was, the architect was George McRae. Um, we love our building, we don't own it. We have uh, been here for 17 years through the courtesy of the City of Sydney, um, who uh, very happily give us this, this wonderful building. George McRae 
was the architect also of the Queen Victoria building in downtown Sydney. So this was constructed in 1893. We are not a perfect white cube gallery. We love that fact. Um, artists love that fact too. So as long as you brace what it, what it is, this heritage building with, with lead light windows and with all sorts of things, shows can look really great. So next, I have to keep a um, film watch. This is uh, just an image of our first space in, um, in 1996. As I mentioned, um, it was a space where everyone from the committee, what became the board, rolled up their sleeves to, to, to paint walls, to run the bar, to make it happen well before we had government funding or anything like that. Our founding member was Melissa Chu, who of course has gone on to be um, one of Australia's most remarkable kind of exports. You know, in 2001, I think about 2001, leaving 4A, she became the um, director of the Asia Society in New York, and now of course is at the Hirshhorn in Washington. Uh, Melissa was just in Sydney giving a talk as I, as I was leaving. I myself have been at 4A for five years, so almost a quarter of its history, um, encompassing both the directorships of Aaron Sito, who many of you might know, uh, who is very, you know, very excitingly now in Jakarta, about to open uh, the Museum Makan, the first Jakarta's, well, Indonesia's first museum of um, modern and contemporary art to open in November, and Michaela Tai, who has been our director since 2015. So next. Um, as I mentioned, 4A has a unique, unique atmosphere, you know, it's, we're, we're a family. I mean, it's the only place I've worked where there really is a kind of feeling of having a, a, an alumni of kind of artists that we've worked with, people that have been involved. Um, it's just so supportive and we really build relationships that just keep developing. I mean, for instance, the, the show that Natasha mentioned at the moment that I've curated being a survey show, one of our founding artist members. Um, so yeah, fundraising is important too. How do we exist? You know, if we're going to talk about exhibition making, money, time, resources. We essentially more or less exist on about 60% government funding. That's a complicated mixture of multi-year funding, of project grants and you know, all the things that we're familiar with. And we raise 40% ourselves, being um, obviously a not-for-profit. And that includes the support of um, prominent foundations through to real grass level kind of fundraising. Uh, we do make more than $6,290 these days at our fundraiser, um, but we still have the ceramic lucky cat 21 years later. So next. Um, okay, what do we do? We have our Haymarket base, we have exhibitions that include solos, all the usual stuff, your usual, I guess, kind of things that we're familiar with programming. Um, but in particular, I think I'd like to point out um, that 4A is really a space that really is often the first, you know, not the only ones, I mean, not to sound too kind of, um, um, you know, um, I guess self-serving, but we are often kind of the first to show key artists working in Asia in, in Australia, at least in terms of solos and so forth. So, Araya Rajamrinsuk, um, of whom we did a survey in 2014, curated by um, John Clark, uh, Professor Emeritus of Asian Art at the University of Sydney, and Claire Veal. Yes, uh, one, of, one or two of her works were in David Elliott's Sydney Biennale in 2010. Uh, we held a very significant um, survey. And also Chen Chu Lin, a real uh, leading artist, um, uh, one of China's leading female artists, and also an artist that comes from uh, and lives and works in Chengdu, and her, his work really explores developments in Western China, particularly in Sichuan. Again, her work was included in the APT in 2010 as well, um, but we, we held a substantial survey. We commission a lot. We commission more than anything. My own career as well with other art centres has been about commissioning. So to give you some context, I've never worked for a collecting institution. I've never worked for a commercial institution. I have probably been part of commissioning works much more than just borrowing them. So, you know, having a loan agreement and a work come off the back of a truck and putting it on a wall, that's a very rare thing for me. Usually it's like, oh, what's it going to look like two weeks before the show? <laughs> you know, so next. Um, of course, we also support emerging artists. So, you know, some examples, Omar Chowdhury, this was his first um, solo show. Uh, he is a Bangladeshi Australian artist, um, uh, lived in Dhaka for many years, creating this really ambitious um, suite of works. Uh, these works have shown it um, in Dhaka, I think, at, um, Sam D well, with support of Sam Dhani Foundation, um, but also he's studying in Brussels now. And James Nguyen, a young Vietnamese Australian artist who created a really amazing body of work to do with his kind of parents' migration history of working, working illegally in sweatshop factories in Western Sydney and so forth. So next. Uh, of course, we have international partnerships. We've worked, uh, we've commissioned you know, major projects, partnerships with partnering Australians with, with artists working in Asia. So people like Keg D'Souza, Room Grouper, a project that looked at um, 
at kind of urban issues around the exploitation of, in particular, international students in Sydney and of, of a certain housing crisis related to that. We often hear in Sydney that the education sector is our largest export, you know, even more than mining, in terms of bringing money and contributing to the GDP. And yet it's a sector that massively exploits, in many ways, the students that come to Australia, and particularly in, 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 our, in our area of, of Haymarket and Chinatown. And increasingly, lots of off-site projects. So under the directorship of Michaela, we're really taking foray to the world uh, and to Australia. So things like the, the inaugural Asia Triennial of Performing Arts at, at, uh, in Melbourne. Next. Um, we also have a professional development program. So we offer a annual Beijing studio program where we send um, uh, emerging and mid-career Australian artists to Beijing for a month um, at the studios of Shen Xiaomin, a prominent Chinese Australian artist who has a long history with foray. Uh, curators intensive, so not dissimilar to this, um, except kind of reverse. So we invite three prominent curators from Asia Pacific to Sydney, uh, and then we fund for, for 10 emerging curators to come to Foray. We have public outcome in terms of having keynotes, but really it's a closed workshop of you know intense 12 hour days of workshops, studio visits, etc. So that has included people like Pooja uh, Sood from College, we brought out last year, Zamina Shah from Karachi, various others and an emerging writers program. So we're really committed to kind of the professional development, doing things that may, not many other organizations are, are really investing. And none of this is, well, one of these are funded in terms of the curators intensive with funding support from copyright agency, but the rest we raise money to do ourselves. So next. And lastly, 4A papers. Um, as Natasha mentioned, this is a, yeah, a new online magazine. I'm not gonna call it a journal, whenever that pretentious, it's, opportunistic in the best sense of that word. So, you know, I hate themes. I hate themed issues. I hate themed magazines. I, you know, I want to be opportunistic, which is to say, I'm in Calcutta, I meet somebody, they have a good idea, they have something, you can be in the next issue, you know, so speak to me. Um, I might just quickly mention one of the, in that first piece, um, Alana Hunt wrote this incredible, she's an artist um, and writer and sometimes curator who really hit the ball out of the park, wrote this incredible piece um, on, on artists working on and, and how they're utilizing social media on issues to do with activism around the issue of, with Kashmir. This piece was picked up by Lee Rhiannon, who is a federal um, uh, uh, senator for the Greens Party of Australia in the federal Senate. Um, she heavily paraphrased um, Alana's piece in the Senate, in Parliament. So it's, on, it's amazing that it's on official record on Hansard of, of parliamentary debate. And actually got a fair bit of criticism from her own part, party, both in terms of saying that it's not her role to talk about foreign policy, and also that the Greens had to come out and say that they don't necessarily support her view of, um, of Kashmir being occupied. And so it was kind of, however you stand on the issue, it was really remarkable that this modest little art, you know, online art magazine in its first issue is in it, it, you know, he's essentially kind of prompted this debate in, in, in the Australian Senate. So I need to really move on. So um, mass group incident. This was a project in 2015 um, that I chose to kind of discuss because I think it's you're one of the most remarkable things we kind of worked on that really I think will give you some view of the kind of ethos of the organisation, how we work. This was co-curated between myself, Aaron Sito, who was director at the time, and Toby Chapman, our curator at the time. Um, very much a team effort and very much indicative of three people that, you know, we have this tiny office that is probably about this big. So when you spend eight, nine, 10, 12 hours a day in this office, uh, there's, no, there's no other office. It's kind of, there's no privacy. You, you really debate and discuss ideas really fervently, uh, argumentative. I mean, it's a really unique environment that I often wonder when I leave for Ray, <laughs> there's gonna be a heavy period of adjustment <laughs> in terms of just keeping my, my mouth shut uh, in, in, in perhaps the more bureaucratic offices. So uh, next, Mass Group Incident was a three, uh, sort of five month project. We were kind of sick of just doing the usual, you know, you have a show, you have a next show, you have the show after that. Yes, of course, those shows are exciting and challenge ideas, but we wanted to conceive something that was, that was bigger, that was more holistic, that had various outcomes in various forms. So um, part of that conversation was kind of, well, too much detail to probably go into, but in terms of three people working collectively, we were looking at the same idea, perhaps from different angles. For myself, even though, yes, I started as an, art, as an artist, went to art school, I come more from a literary background in the sense of um, I worked at bookshops for many years at art school to pay the rent. I worked in publishing well before I worked in the art world. And for me, I've always said, you know, if you read 21 Balzac, Balzac novels, it'll teach you more about the emergence of modernity and how modernity kind of formed a, a human consciousness. 
then reading Frederick Jameson or TJ Clark and those guys are important too and David Harvey and all the rest. Um, but I certainly kind of often take inspiration from literature. Baldwin is one of these people who, looking at not just what he wrote in the 50s, um, his non-fiction, but in particular what happened to his career as a writer in the 60s with the Civil Rights Movement, I think was an interesting paradigm. Um, I say that because, you know, he was 24, his stuff in the 50s is really remarkable. He was 24 years old when he wrote a short essay called Everybody's Protest Novel, uh, which I think is really p pertinent to the way we conceive of political, well, what, what can be called political art or socially engaged art today. It was published in Partisan Review in, in 1949. Interestingly, a couple of months before, you know, other sorts of protests were happening in, um, that led to a revolution in, in, in Peking. And really in this book, he kind of, um, in this piece rather, he, he is really fervently critical of um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. You can read the piece yourself online. But there is a little passage that I kind of want to quote, which really is the kernel of, of um, at least for me, what was the conceptual kind of heart of mass group incident. So in this um, piece, Baldwin says, uh, the protest novel, so far from being disturbing, is an accepted and comforting aspect of the American scene. Uh, ratifying that framework we believe to be so necessary. Whatever unsettling questions are raised are evanescent, titillating, remote. For this has nothing to do with us. It is safely ensconced in the social ar arena, where indeed it has nothing to do with anyone, so that finally we receive a very definite thrill of virtue from the fact that we are reading such a book at all. This report, this report from the pit reassures us of its reality and its darkness and of our own salvation. And as long as such books are being published, an American liberal once said to me, everything will be all right. If you transpose social protest novel to socially engaged art, political art, put this in the context of an art world, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty accurate. Although I need to say explicitly, I'm not obviously conflating the significance of the kind of things Baldwin was writing about in terms of, um, you know, in terms of civil rights movement and, and America coming to grips with its um, slave history with something as inane as art world politics. Just to say that it's, uh, these kind of paradigms can be, can be co-opted to explain some things today. Um, and I mentioned his career insofar as I think the trap for artists today, for all of us, for curators, et cetera, is how can you actually have political agency without while still being an artist. I mean, if you really want to look at the question of what is agency. Baldwin, as much as I love, love, love his writing, I think everyone can, you have to be fair and recognize, certainly by 1962, 63, when he got involved into the civil rights movement, you can watch all these incredible videos on YouTube. I mean, he's um, probably second only to Christopher Hitchens in terms of being a masterful debater. His work really suffered. His novels are, are not great. Right? They're, they're seen as great because he's an important black voice, but they are not, they're not that good. They're not as good as his nonfiction. Because I think the more he was involving himself in, in the realities of, of the kind of um, the revolution, the social revolution that was happening in the 60s, the more his art suffered because art, and particularly writing perhaps, is a solitary activity. So to move on. Um, then we started thinking about the title, Mass Group Incident, Mass Incident. Mass Incident, of course, is a euphemism for a kind of social protests of incidents that happen in, in China in particular. Um, uh, that, you know, are never called protests, but the kind of incidents that happen from, usually from uh, labor disputes, from um, protests over improper law enforcement, from health and safety issues at work, um, and so forth. So we're all familiar with these kind of things. Um, next. Um, we don't look at pie charts all day. I put them in for, for kind of fun, really, because we kind of found ourselves curatorially going down this rabbit hole of kind of like researching the kind of this history of mass incidents in China since, I guess, 2000. But also how they're kind of used in the West to kind of have this quite condescending, condescending attitude to kind of, you know, the usual thing about, about China, about democracy and so forth. And again, you, like, like with Baldwin, using the kind of, I guess, the concept of, of a mass group incident in China, which is to say activity which is being documented by an audience which, uh, which perhaps only, you know, only exists insofar as an audience is there to see it because it's you know, quickly deleted off, off Baidu, off WeChat or whatever, um, which is interesting to think about in a paradigm of what a, 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 kind of a more political kind of performance art. So move on.
Again, we could probably skip this, but you know, we really got into kind of mapping this sort of stuff as a, as a metaphor in which to work curatorially. This is some incidents around. So three-stage project, as I mentioned, the first project was with Young Jung Group with, uh, called Actions for Tomorrow. Um, this sort of arose from um, Aaron's kind of interest in, for a long time, he'd been very much interested in, in Young Jung Group, particularly its um, lead, lead and founding artist member, Jung Guo Gu. Uh, Young Jung Group are based, uh, uh, if you don't know, are based um, in Guangdong province in the um, south, southwest of Guangzhou. And they are a group that pretty much, that are kind of quite anti, that deal with kind of tradition in an anti-authoritarian way. So they kind of, they work within the tradition of calligraphy or rather they, they try to revolutionize the tradition of, of Chinese calligraphy in an approach that is about um, downplaying traditional and um, kind of societal structures of hierarchy and who can, who can participate in culture or, or not. So to move on, we commissioned a new work called Final Days, which happened in our ground floor gallery, which was essentially a shop. Quite interesting because we are in a kind of retail kind of area. Um, Young Jung work a lot with, with the medium of wax as a way, and, and sculpturally as a wax as a kind of visual metaphor for kind of freezing of time and, and slowing down of time and, um, and so forth. So there was a shop of items of clothing um, kind of emerging from previous works they've done in China of items of clothing made in, in, um, in Yangjiang and in the Guangzhou area. They are encased in wax, these paintings with these kind of um, idiotic um, idioms on the wall that kind of were both in a sense kind of work about workers' rights, about um, kind of commodification, about capitalism and so forth. Uh, moving on. It's a detail, next. Uh, this emerged also, of course, from sh uh, studio visit to, to Young Jung. Uh, next. Uh, 10 minutes, I'm gonna have to fly through, okay. So uh, upstairs we commissioned a mural. Um, uh, which was entitled God is Dead, Long Live the RMB. Interestingly, um, this work sort of came about with Jung Gu talking about, you know, in China there's a lot of coverage given to the kind of um, exodus of Chinese capital into Australia in particular, particularly in real estate. This has become a huge kind of political hot potato in Australia, not just because of Sydney being perhaps the um, most expensive city in the world as far as real estate compared to average income, but also the, the influence of, in particular, Chinese capital on that and um, both in... Um, both in, um, I mean, that can be taken in quite way, racist ways as well in terms of right-wing opinions to that. So move on. Uh, they also, we invited them to take over the whole organisation. So they created a work called Tea Office in which we had to drink tea and do this tea ceremony every single day, like almost every hour. Uh, continue. And then we staged a... Uh, a uh, well, um, I'm not going to use the word happening because that's <laughs> so Western. Here I am. But... Um, uh, what they call an after-dinner shufa. So Young Jung Group are kind of known for having these kind of um, uh, drunken kind of wild, you know, kind of dinners where then they make work out of the food. This was staged in the Sydney Chinese Garden of Friendship, which was built in the, in the bicentennial year as a gift from Guangdong province, so it had all that relevance. They, were, um, they work a lot, kind of didn't mention it in the previous work, but the kind of quotes from Das Kapital, which were on these balls. So it was kind of look at this kind of mixture of frivolity and almost this kind of idiotic inanity with, with a kind of history of, 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 of marks within calligraphy and so forth. So next, this is the, the performance, the shufa, and next. And this became one of the works, which then we sold in terms of like helping with funding. We were part of um, uh, Kickstarters and Art Basel Hong Kong's um, partnership uh, in which we were able to raise $20,000 and that sort of came about through selling editions, editions of this work, which was the work that was created as part of this performance. So moving along. I'm going to have to skip quite a bit. Tell Me My Truth was the second part. I included artists from Australia, um, uh, Asian artists working in Europe and also um, in Asia. Next. One of those artists is Tony Schwenson. This is probably the earliest work. This show was much more of the kind of traditional show within the structure of Mass Group Incident in that it was looking more about how then uh, protest, social activity is mediated through screens, is documented and so forth. This work, Be Alert But Not Alarmed, is the earliest in the show. The title comes from, I guess, in the beginning of the kind of war on terror, the Australian government released um, a, a campaign of awareness, shall we say, where every household in Australia got a fridge magnet that said, Be Alert But Not Alarmed. 
and you would stick it on your fridge and there's a hotline to call in case you saw suspicious activity. So in this, Tony kind of conflates this kind of idiotic kind of um, simplistic propaganda with, um, with a kind of history of performance art. I mean, he works very much also looking at people like Arto and Breckett and so forth. The next, I'll skip this. We'll come back to if anyone wants to discuss public housing, but I've worked with Tony before. Next, uh, we could probably skip this too. I've got to move along. And Helen Grace, we commissioned a new work um, in which Chinatown, where we are now, actually, the, the old Chinatown, the 19th century Chinatown, was just slightly over in another part of town. That area was kind of both socially and, and physically cleansed, both in terms of um, issues to do with the plague and, and, and so forth, but also at the turn of the century when Australia became a federation in 1900. Um, and it was shifted to another part of another part of town. And so that part of town now is ahead of, um, of the Australian Federal Police. So it takes up this whole huge block. There's surveillance cameras everywhere. And Helen used that to talk about uh, the visit of uh, Liang Chaoqing, who um, was a you know, prominent um, activist at, in the late 19th century who traveled the world uh, in support of um, reinstituting a monarchy in China. He came to Australia and was actually had huge political influence in the way the, um, in the way Australia can kind of conceived of itself as a, as a federation and then taking that back to China. It's a much more complex story which I have to skate over now. Uh, next. Um, also, the way putting together the exhibition, some interesting things came up itself which kind of mirrored the curatorial structure. So He Shang Yu, who we've worked with before with a big solo project, has this sculpture, Death of Marat who may or may not look like a prominent Chinese artist. Um, and we were not able to show it. We were not able to, delicately, we were not able to obtain an export visa for the work to come from Beijing. And so instead, we negotiated with, with his gallery in white, white Space in Beijing to film the work live and have it on in the gallery. Unfortunately, we have really bad Wi-Fi, so that became problematic. But so instead, the work was filmed for like a long duration, 10, 12 hours. You would often see people walking in the background and so forth. And the work became this kind of live reading of a work in Beijing that cannot come to Australia and so forth. Uh, moving on. I'm going to take, okay, five. I was going to say three, you're generous. <laughs> okay, well, I'm winding up now anyway. So 48-hour incident, I really probably wanted to focus on a bit more. So far, here I am saying that we wanted to play around with our exhibition structure and so forth, and you're probably thinking, well, you've done two exhibitions and something in a party in a garden, so what? Agreed, you know? So really, this was kind of the heart of the project, which was we really wanted to push ourselves, push the organisation to, it's not to say conflating the idea of a curator becoming an artist, but kind of make, make ourselves as vulnerable as the artists, um, as, as responsible, really. So we conceived a 48-hour continuous 48-hour program of performance, live art, interventions, actions. And I really do mean continuous 48 hours, right? So we'll, we'll begin uh, next. So the program went from 6 p.m. on a Friday night till 6 p.m. on Sunday. That meant um, a few hours of sleep here and there. If I was sleeping, one of the other curators was doing their thing, and artists and people sleeping at the gallery and so forth. They were catching a taxi home for a few hours. And it began with, I'll have to, um, I just want to focus on two at the end. So, um, but we had, yeah, maybe about a dozen artists, many of whom have a long history of working with Foray, some new artists that we've commissioned work from. One of those artists with a long history is the Dun Cristanto, who lives in far north New South Wales. He did a series of um, performances that were all based around, um, some of which are, I mean, their, their previous works, as you can see by the dates, kind of reprises based around his kind of long history of his family being um, persecuted in 65, in Jakarta, of course, next. Um, that include acts of violence. So Mass Group Incident Act actually culminated with this work, where people were pelting the dung with these kind of flower bombs. Obviously, you can't do this in a museum. For me, it was actually more than 48 hours because I had to clean the gallery the next day. <laughs> and uh, bringing back Tony Schwenson, who, um, who as a kind of work that explored the history of the labour movement in Australia, which was one of the earliest labour labour movements globally, you know, you know in, in, in that sense, kind of emerging from the Fabian Society and so forth, the Australian Labour Party was really important in terms of the history of, of labour governments. And so, looking at the institution of, of the eight-hour working day, he created a performance that actually went on for about 14 hours. Uh, next. Where for about 14, 16, I can't even remember, 18 hours, he... Um, 
he made this work that spelt out labor ideology, and this went on to about four in the morning, both obviously as a durational performance and as a, as a statement piece. Next. Abdullah M.I. I'm, I'm wrapping up. Abdullah M.I. Saeed, um, Pakistani artist um, from Karachi, who's been living in Sydney for, for quite a while, um, did this amazing work, Bucking and Laundering. Next. Which essentially is a process of him ingesting, actually, well, at least filling his mouth with various um, currency. So from Pakistani rupee to um, uh, US dollars and so forth. You really do have to go online to our website and watch the video. The photographs, you know, really don't do it justice. I mean, it was the only performance where, like, I had my finger on the, on the number to the ambulance. Like, you know, he really, he stuffs his mouth so much that it's, 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 you know, it's like something you wouldn't even do, see or do in Guantanamo Bay. Next. And after he literally vomits, not just spits out, I mean, he kind of induces a vomiting of this currency, which in the end is a mix of rupee, of RMB, of dollars, of Australian dollars, vomits these, these notes out, and then his assistant, he washes them, so he launders them as a visual metaphor, obviously, and then his assistant irons them, and everybody who wants one got like a dollar. So I've got like a, a US dollar that has essentially passed through Abdullah's body on my wall. Next. Um, time, I'll have to skip. Next. <laughs> um, Sam, uh, we also had Samson Young, of course, which uh, experimental audiences know. Next. And Walk the Rock, who staged, uh, we had a, a Sydney's best Metallica cover band do a, do a concert, which was based on, in 1993, there was a big riot in Jakarta when, um, uh, when a group of fans, uh, you know, tens of thousands of people were upset that they couldn't afford tickets to the Metallica concert, they stormed the gig, etc. And I really am wrapping up. Next. Okay, I wanted to really focus on this work. Francis Barrett is an amazing performance artist um, and curator in Australia who comes kind of works within a kind of feminist um, and queer kind of background. She's one that we really rose to the challenge, you know, we really wanted to challenge artists, we were challenging ourselves to be there 48 hours. She proposed a, rest, a work called The Wrestle, where she would wrestle one of us, one of the curators, in the space. This was serious, this wasn't just turning up and putting on shorts, uh, next. This was Fran and Toby. They trained with uh, an Australian Commonwealth Games um, medalist in Western Sydney for a period of about three months, twice a week. I mean, Toby was, you know, you can see like buff. They were both buff. Like they really, they really exercised. It was really quite serious and hard training. I mean, I always tell myself she picked Toby not just because he was younger, but she knew that I would fight dirty because that's, <laughs> that's the way I am. So, so they had a wrestle. And again, the video is pretty incredible in terms of like, um, it becomes both, ob uh, well, obviously a metaphor for not only artist versus, versus curator and artist versus institution in terms of a power dynamic, but obviously one of, 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 gendered, of gendered power. So next. Just before we get to questions, I'll take a quick vox pop. So hands up if you think it was more or less even, an even fight. Hands up if you think Toby, the male one. Where are the hands? <laughs> hands up if you think Francis won. Oh, it's more feminist than I thought. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> All right. Remind me after questions. I'll, I'll reveal. I'll reveal the. Ah, uh, 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 well, yeah. Well, you know, I picked this photo in particular. It's a close call. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Next. And this was after the fight with Carissa Holland, who was the trainer. Next. And finally, we can just scroll through these quickly. Um, these are the last five slides. So Latai Tomapayu next is an artist uh, of Tongan heritage who she really was the most durational. So she was there for 48 hours. Every four hours, she would apply a coat of paint. The paint actually, the brand name was actually Black Magic, which we got sponsorship for, which was fantastic, which was the kind of paint that, uh, you know, what do you call them? Bodybuilders use. Um, doing that as someone who, who considers herself a, a panika, which is kind of a Tongan word for not, not, not performance art, not a Western paradigm of kind of a body-centered artist and for someone who kind of, um, whose communication is enacted through body movements. And so this was actually real quite dangerous. We had to do a whole bunch of research. You know, you, you think of Goldfinger, that scene where, you know, the woman suffocates because all of her skin can't breathe. So I was worried about all of that. And it got quite, you know, uh, as a comment on both you know, in Australia, thinking of the, the common conception of the golden, the golden Aussie, the golden Australian, where it's perfectly acceptable to be bronzed and to be, and to be brown, and yet, obviously, if you're already brown, that's something you don't want to be. So next, and yeah, by the end, the gallery, after 48 hours, exhausted, was left with all of the kind of, um, the residue of these performances. <laughs>
and that's about it. Stickers, yeah. Oh, I'll reveal the score, shall I? Yeah. Or the wrestle, yeah. Okay, well, in a, in a Commonwealth game, um, I think you go up to 18. I don't understand 18, I guess, you know, like um, table tennis is up to 21. So it was 18-0, the, ma the male won. <laughs> so sorry. And I forgot to add, too, that, um, you know, the extra interesting thing in the, in, the, in, the, in the work was that, given that it was, I mean, so many of the pieces in the work you saw was about this question of labour and so forth, was... Frances brokered a deal with us, which was that if she won, we had to double her artist fee, which was quite substantial to begin with. And if she lost, she got nothing. So not only did a male, a straight male curator, you know, smash a feminist artist's face into a floor mat, we also ripped her off because we didn't pay her. So it was kind of, the whole project became quite indicative um, in a playful way. I mean, obviously, I know you've just met that I am being playful here. <laughs> I'm not a violent person, but... Um, the whole project became indicative of this kind of power dynamic. <laughs> Are you scared to sit next to me? <laughs> I won't fight you, I promise. Well, I'm going to fight you with one okay. question now. Um, and please raise your hands up. Uh, we also have um, questions from our web audience, um, which we're going to take, if, if there are any. Um, but maybe since you started with uh, this project, um, perhaps to share a little bit more also because it seems in C Pearl White Cloud and I know Trevor Young's practice, sure. um, which uses quasi-scientific methods and also over time observing yeah. um, certain sorts of organic environments and architectures, etc. Um, so it's a sort of inhabited approach of working. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if this is something that is prevalent in your practice, um, also to the extent that what you're researching is looking at the relationship between art and, and public housing as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always less inclined. I use the word durational because it's like any other art word. It becomes shorthand for something that we kind of, we all know understands. It, something like that is still quite limiting. Am I interested in time? Who, I mean, who isn't, you know? I, I guess I'm more interested in, in kind of um, work that deals with contested, contested histories. And in particular, I mean, I brought James Baldwin into the conversation. I mean, some people might think, well, what's a 1950s you know, black writer got to do with a kind of paradigm now, let alone a visual art paradigm, let alone a visual art paradigm that seeks to be working in Australia and Asia. And for me, it's really kind of using, I mean, you mentioned the word methodology, and I think that's what I'm interested in, kind of using, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a way of collage, of using methodologies that kind of have one meaning in one realm, that when they're either applied or whether they become analogous to another realm, can not only be a contradistinction, but can be a contradiction to that realm. So to take, to take a kind of aesthetic culture, I'm often, what I'm most interested in, in I guess, a curatorial practice in general, or just in, in, a, in a person with, with two eyes interested in visual culture, is that how underneath the surface, underneath the aesthetic layer of something can run a moral universe that is in contradiction to that surface. And for me, that's important and, and why I probably reveal a bit of myself bringing up Baldwin because the word moral is something that you don't usually hear in, dis in art discourse, uh, particularly in secular, perhaps, you know, societies or secular discourses because of its inference with religion and well, the question of where morals come from and so forth. And it's a deeply unfashionable word, but I don't care. For me, any discussion of aesthetics has to happen within a paradigm of ethics and morality. Are there any, yeah, there's a question there. <laughs> Hi, I'm, really, I'm, I'm Lily. I've come in from Singapore just for this. Yes, so, I know. I saw you at the airport. Yeah, we were on the same plane. <laughs> um, and we checked in at the same time. Yeah. Plane, but live separately. Hello. Yes, hi. So, um, so I'm, I'm kind of, it's also my first hub. So I'm, I'm ch kind of chomping at the bit here, but just give me about 24 hours and then I'll be done. Um, I, you might have um, answered this question, but I just want to probe you a little bit more. Um, about your 
um, basically your strategy. Um, you, you bring up interesting words like contested histories, like morals and ethics and all that. How, how do you go about in your strategy as you plan, um, and I'm really glad you did the, what is it called, mass group incident, that whole series. The fact that, um, do you, do you kind of look at your interests and what's going on in um, sort of in the discussions, whether it's in Australian communities or press, or what's kind of going on internationally, and that you try to um, formulate uh, a program and a strategy on what you are planning to stage over what period of time. The reason why I ask this is um, not not to go down the, the usual curatorial question of you know how do you how do you how do you actually do something, but because you've done so many years of this and you've done your center has been around twenty years, you know what kinds of things have you learned that you can tell us that says well actually the way that you formulate a strategy and what's really worked because at the end. You are doing this not for yourself. You're really doing yeah. this for the people who come to visit the center. So who are you trying to influence? Who are you trying to transform? And say, for example, say for example, the program that you've just done, very extensive, four or five parts to it, that works. Because you're staying on point on something that's very complicated and very extensive. <coughs> and from what you know, that this is actually a good way to stage and strategize art events. So I, I, I hope I'm kind of clear yeah. on my question. Look, to say the broader question of, uh, say, programming at 4A, sure, I kind, of, I kind of perhaps briefly touched on in the beginning, in terms of my introduction to the organization, of, say, over the 21 years, how it's changed. In the very beginning, so, and into this short response will be kind of, potent, hopefully, touching on who, who we do, you know, who we do all this for. In the beginning, it was very much a question of, um, of visibility. You know, and, and pretty straightforward, of having Asian Australian, well, Asian Australian voices in, in a climate that had very little of that. Um, as things developed, say, with the directorship of someone like Bing Wei Huang Fu in the kind of uh, early, mid-2000s, we just became a lot more international. This is someone who had worked at, um, I think was the founding director of the ICA in Singapore. Uh, worked at Shanghai Zendai MoMA. But whilst at the same time, we became much more focused on China. That wasn't necessarily an issue. I mean, we are in the heart of Chinatown. We are um, a big constituency of, our, of ours, uh, Chinese Australians and Chinese people. But certainly by the time Aaron Cedar became director, uh, it was kind of accepted that we were too China focused. Um, and so Aaron really was the one, I think, responsible for really broadening Foray's dialogue to not. And this is not to, I mean, you know, I'm not writing off the previous years by any means, but I'm just saying to have, this, have the sophistication to, real, to realise that we can't be conceiving of what we do both geographically per se and ethnically. And so to really allow the programming to become much more sophisticated than that. In terms of then how we program now, I mean, as I said, it really comes down to, of course, you know, we have a director, we have a board, we have strategies, we have KPI and, and all of that. But it is always a team effort, and that includes the board. We are rare in that sense. You know, our board is, um, we have sort of an annual strategy meeting where, of course, we come to the table with, with ideas and so forth, but the kind of narratives forming around those ideas, whether it be a year where we might focus on issues around migration and so forth, is, is really a team effort. In terms of, you know, Every program has its different audience. So something like mass, well, something like 48 hour incident, we probably had about 3,000 people over that weekend. For us, 3,000 would probably represent a uh, visitation for a kind of, I guess, a standard, a standard show, a standard seven, eight week show that wasn't like a stratospherically popular show, shall we say. That was still a mixed audience. I mean, it's everything from obviously a younger demographic through to um, people that, look, a better example is probably this. The show at the moment, Da Chi Dung, this is an artist, founding artist member, was a refugee from, from Vietnam, escaped on a boat, went through Palau Badong, arrived in Australia in 83. The number of people that have been coming into this gallery, and this is one reason why we did this show, because that story, which is so significant to our mig migration history of not only Australia but of Sydney, that accepted tens of thousands of Vietnamese um, because of our participation in the war, 
in a, in a climate where a liberal polit politician, Malcolm Fraser, did this, which would be kind of unthinkable these days, so many people who are definitely not arts goers, are, are, you know, have been coming in because we, we can never take for granted that the sheer act of seeing a kind of a kind of a kind of story, you know, in the public realm, in a gallery, that also not just in any gallery, but a gallery that has some sort of respect in a national and international dialogue, you can't take for granted, and um, that's more important than any kind of curatorial ambition or, or checkboxing or strategic initiative, you know. Um, how it all comes out in the wash for you or for anyone else, well, that's, that's not really a question for me to <laughs> respond to. That's for everyone else. So just to be provocative, based on that last point that you mentioned, the, the, that show by the Vietnamese artists, so that's kind of coming back to the original core kind of exhibit that 4A does. Uh, absolutely. And, we'll and that's what... We're quite, we're quite explicit about that in the sense of, um, of, you know, when we're talking about programming for this year. I mean, when Michaela came on board as director and said, "What, what should we do? What should we be doing more of?" Um, I was one of the people that said, "Well, I think we've lost, not lost touch, but I mean, we have always worked with some of our founding artist members, but we have never staged." A survey, you know, we use that word hesitantly because it's a modest space. I mean, square meter each, we're probably about as big as Experimenter, maybe a little bit bigger. So, you know, but it is an on, your, on a, a genuine survey. We have most of the key works in, 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 in Darcy's work. And also really wanted to return to this question of um, a kind of unacknowledged, not contribution, I mean, kind of unacknowledged experience um, within a context of seeing the difference between, say, 1996, a difference between 1970s, where we accepted all those refugees, a difference between in 1989, when the Australian Prime Minister, Bob Hawke at the time, famously cried, wept on national television on, the, on June 4th, when he saw what happened in Tiananmen Square, and decreed from that day on that any Chinese student studying in Australia could become a permanent resident. Tens of thousands of Chinese became residents in that way, including a whole generation of well-known Chinese Australian artists. To have that conversation now in 2017, you know, is an entirely different conversation or entirely different context. And that's one way for staging shows like that. Very good, thank you. I, I, I think I got everything that you said as you were going through your presentation until the wrestling showed up. <laughs> then, then it wasn't really that Asian. It could have been anywhere. Then I thought, well, what's going on here? But it was great. It was great that you sure. had the wrestling. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Oshmita and I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, so I have, it's an observation slash uh, question perhaps. Um, when you talk about James Baldwin and uh, you, you did say that uh, you know, his fiction suffered because as you said that art is a solitary activity. And then you talk about you know, socially engaged art and uh, you know political agency. So how do you reconcile? Because there's somewhere you did talk about the moral issue as well. So how do you reconcile? I don't. I don't reconcile. I, I don't. Uh, re I don't really believe you. You can, which is what makes art interesting. Which also comes back to the question of um, the greatest. I think reconciliation is is not for me. Is not a question of a kind of. And, not, and I'm not saying you're asking this question, but for me, a kind of boring question of the usual kind of debates around socially engaged art and whether it's effective, whether it's not, whether it's pre preaching to the converted and so forth. For me, the interesting question is one between complicity and expediency, which is to say that those two, you know, th that balance is unavoidable for all of us. I mean, here I am talking about, oh, well, we did all this stuff, whatever. I I'm as much complicit or expedient in... <laughs> As a curator, or even that, curator is a limiting word. As a worker, I can't help but not be um, expedient, whether it's for my career, whether it's for my ego, all those selfish reasons. So no matter what my personal politics are, or what I might want to achieve, I think the first thing you need to acknowledge if you're going to work in that realm, if you're going to create work like that, if you want to be true to yourself, let alone to, 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 to an idea bigger than you, is that you're always producing something from a position of compromise. And what defines your character, what defines your position as an artist, be it aesthetically, be it, well, maybe not formally, but be it any, any sort of um, 
conviction or worth that your work might have is is the degree or the face of that of that compromise. So I don't really see. Sure, we can have a discussion about if you're a performance artist. Uh, you know, clearly you're not the same as someone tapping on a typewriter in 1949. The world has moved on, perhaps, from that kind of cultural production. But I brought up that kind of contrast specifically to kind of the point I wanted to make with Baldwin, as I kind of mentioned, was that. I think for some artists, and I'm not saying they're right or wrong, I mean, you can infer my own belief. You reach a point where if you want to have real political agency in your work, or social agency, or let's, let's leave out politics, that's actually probably uh, another thing, but social agency, you almost have to leave the art. I mean, you know, how much can art do? Which is one reason why Baldwin, I don't think, changed consciousness by writing another, another country. You know, his famous novel from, well, his best known novel from 1962. I think he changed consciousness through his participation in the live debates, in the round, in the civil rights movement. By doing that, he was, his art, his art suffered and his art suffered greatly. And that's a kind of choice that he had to make. And that's a kind of choice which a lot of artists and curators and everyone in this room perhaps makes or ignores or chooses not to really face at all. Thank you. Hi, thank you for that presentation. Um, actually, to go back to Baldwin too, but I guess in the, this idea of like maybe using the format of a social justice novel as a methodology with which to say transplant um, toward a curatorial practice, uh, that's really interesting. But I guess what I'm wondering is how far it goes or like how far it can be pushed. Um, and particularly with the examples that we've seen, a lot of this work is you know, very performative, very explosive, and, and like, engenders a type of audience. Um, so in order to have these, say, like maybe resist, like shows around social resistance, can they look, can they look other than this? Can they have other types of material form formations? Um, or does it rely on this kind of, this kind of long durational performative quality? Yeah, I mean, they can look however they want to look, I mean, is the short answer. I mean, for us, um, sure, they're strong visuals. We have great photo documentation, you know. But for me, it's not really a question of how they look, it's how it, how it works, which obviously with limited time and kind of unable to go into in the presentation. But that's to say, what I like about this project was its failures. And failure is a way of learning, so I don't really, you know, care what, you know, success or failure really means. And that's to say, we put the challenge on ourselves to really test ourselves to question, well, how, how, how committed are we to, does our commitment to present artists to be you know, arts workers, to be arts professionals, um, does it even begin, does it even begin, not compare, but does it even begin to compare to commitment from artists? One point that might illustrate this, and this is an interesting failure in this regard in terms of how it might look, is so Frances Barrett, the artist who proposed the wrestle, actually her first proposal to us was that she wanted to, given that we were going on for 48 hours, that from the, the evening until the early hours of the morning, because obviously when you're working with a group, you know, who's doing what, some works were two minutes long, some works were t 14 hours long. So we're sort of managing the, just the logistics of this programming. And she said, I want to turn 4A, turn the gallery, turn the premises into, um, um, into a sex club for lesbians or for queer people. So we were like, wow, yeah, she's really, you know, we've, we asked her for a challenge, she's really put on the table. And so, not that, you know, it's anything to do with the sex, but to do with like, well, we, our building is courtesy of the city of Sydney. You need a license to do that kind of thing and run a, you know, sex parlor in Sydney and all of that and OHS and, you know, even staging up, you know, everything we did. I mean, you still work within these strictures of, you know, I've got to have the first aid kit ready and is Abdullah going to choke to death and all those questions. And so we really did look, I mean, Aaron, Toby and I really did look into can, can we do this? And in the end, you know, Francis won. One as in like, you know, we, we had to admit this is too contentious and too logistically difficult for us to run a sex shop overnight for two nights. <laughs> and so we didn't do it. So um, I'm not sure how much that answers your question, but I mean, I, I'm not, um, 
of course, we all have an art historical knowledge. All of that stuff's important. But I don't, I don't, you know, I don't come from an art historical, historical background. I don't really conceive. I conceive of history as broader than just an art history. Of course, I read, I write, all of that stuff. But certainly, compared to say more museolo museological approaches to, and I would be hesitant also to call it like a social justice novel. Or, I mean, you know, I, I know we're using again, we're using shorthand. And so I suppose what we wanted to do was to to use euphemisms, which are also a kind of shorthand, like mass group incident, to really try and to ask ourselves, well, why are we using shorthand at all? You know, wh wh why can't we just kind of act, act, act what you say? Um, I had one more question that sort of went into your, your background. So you trained as an artist, right? And I'm just wondering, especially since a lot of your work has to do with commissioning, how do you feel that your artistic training perhaps informs your commissioning and your curatorial conversations from there on? Sure. And do you, are you still managing to make art no. or not? No. Um, I, well, first of all, I mean, it's not had been a conscious decision. I've just been very fortunate in terms of the, you know, being part of commissioning works. Um, I guess a little background, you know, I went to, um, well, maybe just two sentences because, you know, you might be wondering in terms of personal context. So, obviously, Pedro de Almeida, I was born in Portugal in 1980. So, my family um, emigrated from Portugal to, well, first in Adelaide when I was three years old. Um, and like many families of that generation in Portugal, comes from a context of, you know, um, some history in Africa. My mother growing up um, in Angola before the war, or my father doing his compulsory military service during the very dirty war in Mozambique. And of the kind of backwash, even though it was 1983 and almost a decade after the revolution in Portugal, we are talking about a period of the longest running fascist government in all of Europe, which people tend to forget from 1926 to 74. So we arrived in Adelaide in a um, migrant hostel, which at the time, 83, was predominantly refugees from Vietnam, Cambodia, etc. It's one of the very few Europeans then, even though this had existed since post-45. I also grew up in Western Sydney, uh, which statistics tell us is possibly the most multicultural place in the world, something like 183 language groups. The, the kind of land package, lower middle class, regular, boring suburbia, cul-de-sac I grew up in. The neighbours were, you know, to give you some idea, were kind of, you know, people that have fled the Ayatollah, the Ayatollah's revolution, a Fijian Indian family, a Tongan Samoan family of Seventh-day Adventists, an old widow whose, whose husband had died in New Guinea fighting the Japanese, an Aboriginal family, and, um, and people that have fled Ceausescu. So that kind of environment was normal for me. That's why I'm committed to social diversity. I was lucky enough, having gone to art school, then working in publishing, because I aspired to be a writer. I was in love with books. I worked at bookshops, including antiquarian bookshops at art school. Uh, by the age of 27, having never worked, you know, obviously working with artists, I mean, uh, having artists as friends and being part of that whole thing and, and being engaged with contemporary art, but I had never worked a day in my life in a gallery by the age of 27. I was lucky enough to, by that stage, Campbelltown Art Centre, which now is very much a premier organisation um, that is a non-collecting organisation in Campbelltown, in Western Sydney, that has a real clear focus of commissioning works, multidisciplinary, so contemporary dance, visual art, etc. My first day on the job in 2008 was this big IOA show. This was a big survey show in Campbelltown, in the western suburbs, you know, 50 kilometres from downtown Sydney, leading up to the Olympics with Birds Nest Stadium and all that. This is a show that could have happened in London, New York, whatever. It was happening in a <sighs> you know, in, in a suburb that I grew up with, full of public housing and, and all sorts of issues. So it was pretty amazing. And that was the director at the time, Lisa Havlow, who's now the director of Carriage Works. So in my period at Campbelltown Arts Centre, it's how I got to know Foray. It's how I had the opportunity to be, to be part of the teams that we really focused on commissioning. So I'm not going to sit here and say, um, you know, it wasn't like I, I, I did not have the usual trajectory of studying curatorial studies or studying art history and saying, I want to do this. I was kind of, you know, I got lucky and I had, I think, not to sound immodestly, but I think the very fact that I had interests well beyond just contemporary art or, or, or so forth, like, like literature, and have grown up in that context and understanding that does inform that. And that includes working with artists. I mean, I guess the very short answer to, to the question in terms of having studied art, of course. I mean, I think anyone who, goes, who, who, who once studied art or was an artist, whatever that means when you're 21, 
it really does make a difference because it's really clear when you work particularly not to write everyone off that works at a big museum, but when you work for people with museums, when you work in partnership, it's really clear that, oh, you're a curator that works with dead people or you're a curator that kind of your engagement with an artist is, you know, through a contract and you have champagne at the opening and you see them, you know, I say to people, you're not really curating until you've, um, um, until you've hung an artist's um, underwear out to dry. And, and an intern once said to me, oh, that's a great, that's a great metaphor. And I said, no, no, no until you've actually lived with them in Guangzhou for three weeks, working 14 hours a day, making work, and you literally did the washing and hung their underwear out to dry, you know, because that's how closely, that's how closely you're working with them. And so, uh, for me, all that stuff's perfectly natural. You know. Thank you for your <laughs> honest answers. Um, we'll take then one very last question because we're running out of time. I was interested uh, when you were referring to Baldwin's work and then saying that his activities as an uh, engagement necessarily did not help his work. I'm trying to differentiate these two paradigms, art and engagement, as maybe sometimes becoming different. And you also being an artist and moving into a kind of a practice which might, I don't know how it uh, reflects that, what Natasha was asking, but how, uh, when you are bringing in artists who are uh, engaging their own body, their own performative notions into a kind of a uh, viewership situations and being a kind of space, how you sort of negotiate with these multiple kind of viewing strategies and, and I was uh, really interested in whether how uh, as a practicing, uh, not as a practicing artist, but as an artist with the background of engaging with this kind of a museum or kind of a gallery sure. situation, so you're generating your viewing also as a kind of a strategy. Uh, is there a kind of margin points of your own intention as an artist and what you are? Uh, because I, I'm not very convinced with the idea that art and engagement necessarily uh, are two different situations in a <laughs> practice situation. Because today when you're referring volume, you're extending it into a kind of an engagement with a kind of a viewer who does not really, may have not engage with his practice itself, but you're extending it to a certain day. So I was just interested in that part. Yeah, and perhaps I misexpressed myself in terms of this. I didn't want to set up a kind of false binary of saying, well, you can only, an artist can only um, have some sort of social political agency if, if, you know, if they're debating in the field and whatever and, and, and writing a book. Of course not. I mean, that's why, that's what's so great about those, those non-fiction pieces by Baldwin in the 1950s because they really, they really, um, and still today, no, no, no one's got anything on them. I mean, no one has, no, no black American writer has ever surpassed the way he conceptualizes certain politics and identity in those works. But second of all, I feel like, uh, yeah, I can't really answer your second question. I mean, Natasha mentioned I went to art school, but I'm not an artist, you know. I went to art school, it was probably a difference. I mean, you know, whatever, you're 21, I, you're, I, whatever. I had aspirations too, but I realized quickly I didn't, um, even before I graduated, I realized I wasn't going to pursue art, and, and mostly because I realized I was a, probably a better, a better writer. Um, I was, and, and enjoyed that more, and a better organizer, and for me, I guess, the, whatever, my capability was not commensurate with my, um, you know, um, what makes you a decent curator is obviously to have a good eye and to have good judgment. And my own uh, eye and judgment could see that my own work was derivative, so I stopped. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro. Um, we'll, we'll need to end and move on to our, our next uh, speaker. Um, but there will be, as we said, uh, a, a a conclusive discussion in which we could take up some of these questions as well. Thank you.